yeah so look thank you very much everyone for joining um you know it's great that every time we do this we seem to get more and more people joining so that's really fantastic uh obviously this is the pre sales collective uh bi-monthly book club i guess we're bi-monthly now something like that we roughly bi-monthly anyway um and yeah we are absolutely uh so happy to have max uh yoda here who uh is obviously the author of the fantastic do better work uh which uh has been the book this this time around um and this is fantastic that we get to have Max here for a Q&A. So I think what we, how we will probably run this is basically just Stephen, Stephen and I might have a couple of starter for 10 type questions going on. Uh, and then obviously we can take um, questions from the audience. Uh, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask, or you can use the chat, whichever is good for you, I guess. And um, yeah, Max, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. I, I'm going to pop my earbuds in. I think it, the audio will be better for you all. So I'm going to do that. One sec. Sorry. No problem. No problem. I could be wrong about that, but we'll see. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Let's talk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so who wants to open? I'll, open? I'll open with a question, which uh, is always something that you know, I'm sure every author gets asked every time they do this, but I do think it's interesting, which is that's when you first like sat down to write the book or what, what was the motivation for writing the book? What was the initial sort of motivation that led you to, to do this? The initial motivation was being asked to and, and being asked <laughs> to consider it uh, by, by our, by our marketing uh, leader, Kyle Lacey. He, uh, I had been writing weekly notes and he was like, hey, we should compile some of these notes into a book. It did not turn out to be that easy, but his hope was that uh, we could just take some things that I'd already written and kind of give them some shape. Uh, so that was the initial inspiration. Ultimately, when the book started to work, uh, uh, the inspiration was if we could document what it looks like to be the teammate that we want to see more of at Lessonly, that's just going to help the business every day. Uh, so that, 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 was a, that was a bit of clarity that we didn't have right out of the gate. You know, at the beginning, thinking about writing a book, we didn't really know what it was going to be about because Kyle was like, hey, you should write a book. And I was like, OK, tell about what? And he was like, you'll figure that out. And once I did figure it out of saying, like, it'd be really nice to have our teammates uh, have more clarity uh, around uh, what it looks like to do better work at Lessonly, um, knowing that that would just make my days easier every day of my life gets easier if people can. Uh, go to our reference uh, for what it looks like to do something well, or go to a menu of ideas when they're stuck, which ultimately is what Do Better Work was for our team, and I hope it is for other people. When they're stuck in a relationship, when they're stuck in a project um, where they're working with other people, or even themselves, you know, going to that list of chapters and saying, which one of these behaviors might get me unstuck? Uh, which, which one of these behaviors might push things forward? So it might be that I have to have a difficult conversation, and I'm stuck because I'm not having that difficult conversation. It might be that I need to share before I'm ready. I'm trying to be a perfectionist. I'm in my little vacuum and I need to get out of my vacuum uh, and find out what other people think. So this is, you know, it ultimately was a menu uh, of, of behaviors that we think just unstick people. Um, and that was when we really tapped into that as the driving force for the book, it all started to just go faster, be smoother. Um, and the chapters became more self-evident. That makes sense? Yeah, awesome. This is a great answer. So, so it's interesting because obviously, uh, you know, it was inter originally like internally for people at Lessonly, but actually it's grown to be much bigger than that right now. It's now it's right. spread by a much wider audience than that. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I'll tell you, David, that was, that actually helped a lot too in the writing process was just understanding that uh, we need to write this to a very specific audience. But if we write to that specific audience um, and we get to the root of some problems, it's going to be real. Uh, it's going to be relevant to just to more than that specific audience. Like these are human relationship behaviors, mm -hmm. right? When we relate to one another, it really helps to be vulnerable. It really helps to share before we're ready. It helps to look for opportunity in our relationships and our situations. So like we were very specific, but we knew that the specific was probably going to be generalized. If we nail, if we nailed it for our team, other teams aren't that much different than us, right? They're not solving wildly different problems, but, but not trying to write a book that pleased the world was, it would have been impossible for me to do that, right? That was kind of uh, soul crushing thinking about everybody's opinion, 
But if I thought about, you know, one specific person's opinion at Lessonly or just our team's opinions, uh, things got easier. The wind was at my back. Mm. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Max, you, uh, uh, you tell hi. a story. No, go uh, ahead. Do you want to go first? No, you, please go right ahead. No, I just wanted to ask, uh, and apologies for the noise, my son just came back from the daycare. Uh, no I wanted to ask the author regarding the part, share before you're ready. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in pre-sales, yes, you know that you're preparing your PPTs all the time, etc. And when you share to the your PPT, it's going to be to other pre-sales or to your manager or to the delivery team, you know, when you're doing the whole workshop. If you share before you're ready, you get if you get inputs for from 10 different people, 15 different people, at the end, it's not really what you wanted to show. So, I mean, I understand that um, the input is very important. And you, you mentioned in your book that you were doing something nine months. Uh, I cannot remember what mm -hmm. exactly. And that yeah. at the end, of the it was almost useless because nobody wanted it or it didn't, you know, answer the, some of the critical questions or had some features that it's supposed to have. But can you give, I don't know, like um, recommendation time-wise, at least for the, for the uh, prep of the PPT or, or for the demos or in, in, in kind of that sense? Yeah, so you, I'm not you, you, do it for nine say... months, probably, but um, yeah, yeah. still, I think it has to have a flow or, you know, it needs to have something from you, how you, you want to, to direct the flow of the workshop presentation, et cetera, and then to include the, the feedback from the other participants. Yeah. Yeah. So if I, if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, what, what I think I'm hearing you say, and tell me if, if it's, if I'm, if I'm missing something is if I get too many opinions and I have to take all those opinions, it becomes this kind of yeah. Frankenstein diluted work. And that's not what anybody wants. Is, is that accurate? Uh, <laughs> I think your mother just left the room. But I, I feel like that's what she was just oh, saying. There we go. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, no. We got another guest. Excellent. Say hi. Add, add him to the roster. Yeah. <laughs> hello. Uh, hello. Receiving the younger participants in the book club, he can read a bit. <laughs> he likes mostly pictures, though. He can speak yes. three languages. So. But yeah, back to my question. Yes, that's what I was referring to. So when you get yeah, input awesome. from. Yeah. I think it's really important uh, that we do not mistake uh, voices for votes. And that's something that uh, I think is often what happens when people uh, hear that they need to go talk to other people. And then they're like, well, what if I don't want to include their opinions because I don't agree with them? Or it's just not the direction that I think, you know, is the way to go. Um, I think that we, it's really important that we hear voices, but we do not confuse them with votes. So if we go to somebody and they give us feedback or 13 people and they give us feedback and we don't like, you know, 10 out of the 13 people's uh, direction, I don't think we should go with it simply because it was what the most people said. I don't think that's what leadership is. The times when I was most challenged uh, in my job at Lessonly was when 10 people said go left, three people said go right. And I believe that going right was the way to go. But I knew that those 10 people were going to be frustrated uh, because that they didn't agree. I didn't go, you know, I didn't go left because 10 people said so. I went right. And if you're in, in you know, overseeing a PowerPoint, uh, you know, project, which is, I think is what you meant when you said PPT, um, if you're actually in charge of it, uh, getting voices and still making an ultimate decision on your end of what you should incorporate and not, um, I think is the way to go. If somebody gets frustrated at you for, you know, that you came to them and you asked their opinion, um, and you did not go with their opinion, I think it's important that you do go back to them and say, hey, thanks for your you know, suggestion to do A. Um, I went B and here's why. Uh, it's not because I think you're wrong. It's just I thought B was the right thing for the project. If I find out later that you know, your suggestion uh, for A makes more sense, I I'll switch. But I want to start trying with B and see what happens. If, if folks around you, you know, don't allow that kind of work, I think that tells you something more about your environment than the process. Uh, I think the process should be indicative of, uh, you know, whether people are comfortable sharing their opinions and not having them immediately come to fruition. Because I don't think anybody should have the expectation that if I share my opinion with you, you better go do it, right? But I do think that that's unfortunately um, a lot of times how people think about seeking feedback. Well, if I get the feedback, I have to take it. And I'm saying, let's draw a line between those two things. We can hear people's voices, but not use them as votes because that's not what leadership is. So I'm going to pause now and see if I missed, misunderstood or if anything you want to clarify. No, no, all good. Maxime, you good? He's fine too. So we're good. Thank you. What, what, what is your son's name? Maxime. 
Oh, awesome. So my name's Max. That's awesome. Uh, so yeah. Ma Max, Max, Max for short, I'm Maxwell. <laughs> Maxwell, well, say hi. Say hi. You want to send a gift? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> His first book club. Yeah, he's due. We, we start early. <laughs> Yeah, when, I, when I give you that answer, do you um, do you say like that's not going to work in my world? Like I, I would love to hear your your candid feedback. Uh, I love your book, honestly, and not only because it's it's short and I read it like in uh, uh, very fast, uh, but also because uh, yes, I've been into situations where I mean I'm in pre sales so yes, we, we prepare the presentations and we prepare the demo, etc., and mm -hmm. I would as you said, close and do what I think was right. And then mm -hmm. when you show it to someone and they, you know, share some opinions and which maybe, which are right, basically like, okay, you didn't include this, you should include that, blah, blah. But then as you already, you know, prepared all of that. And when someone tells you, especially sales, like uh, two hours before the demo or something like, ah, oh, could you do this? Could you do this? then it you know it it kind of flips so in that case i don't want to change but if if yeah. you apply what you described in time and ask them beforehand uh is there mm -hmm. something that add then it will work it just uh, it, yeah. it needs some, um you know balance so to speak but your yeah, advice I think one thing that i thought was really interesting in this context is this share before you're ready um the most successful things, sometimes the most successful people to share with in pre-sales are actually your customers because we share a lot internally, like when we're preparing for sales meetings, you know, we're like, we get advice from lots of different colleagues, but sharing before you're ready with a customer, that's quite a smart thing to do because you want to get their take on what you're going to present to like a wider audience or whatever. And yeah. so I thought, I, I actually kind of read that and thought of the context of sharing with a customer before it's ready. And I think a lot of people are hesitant to do that because they don't want to show a less than perfect solution to a customer. But actually that could be a really yeah, part powerful. Did you ever have a demo everything works perfectly? Right, right. Yeah, no, of I course, have not. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, before it's ready, it's what we do for a living. I do. Right, right, sure, sure, fair enough. David, I, I agree with you that that can be very powerful. It depends on the customer. Uh, you know, if you have a very nervous customer, I think it can be a different situation where they might get nervous seeing anything that looks like it's going to embarrass them later in front of their colleagues. But if you have somebody who I think is, you know, kind of centered in their space and you can come to them and say, this is a napkin sketch and I want to show you the napkin sketch because I don't want to polish something that you don't need. You know, I think somebody, yeah. uh, I think people respect that, right? If they're in the in the headspace that is not too hyper anxious, they respect that and appreciate it. Steve, I think you had a question. Yeah, yeah Max, you uh, I you tell a great story about um, early, you know, as you were working with High Alpha and Scott Dorsey when you guys would run into a wall. Scott would come in and kind of help you reset, relook at things and, yeah. and, and wouldn't really give you any feedback till after you'd regained momentum. And I'm interested in how Scott's approach with you guys, you've been able to apply that, you know, both at Lessonly and in your greater relationships as a whole. Yeah, yeah, I think momentum. So Steve, thanks for bringing that up. My, uh, my business partner and best friend, Connor Burt, uh, he is all about momentum. Uh, he, is, he believes that if we don't have momentum, we need to be asking ourselves, how do we get a little bit of it? And if we do have a little bit of momentum, he asks, like, how do we get more? Uh, like the, the wind at the back, you know, is everything when it comes to creativity uh, and people flowing and kind of thinking, uh, thinking differently. When we feel like the wind's not at our back, you know, we are in a stressed, anxious posture. Uh, and those are times when we're in a, you know, a fear mindset, and that is not where we start to see more options, we start to see fewer options. So momentum being a, a very big deal, we learned that from Connor, we learned that from, I learned that from Connor, I learned that from Scott, those, those two people bleed, you know, building momentum and keeping it. Um, and, the, you know, the way Scott helps us build momentum is, is he, uh, if we had just made a mistake, he would focus on finding out a plan B to get us, you know, maybe our plan A just blew up in, in our faces. You know, he'd, he'd ask us, do we still care about the goal of plan A? The answer is yes. Well, then we need a plan B and he'd help us get that plan B instead of kind of admonishing us or kind of, you know, wagging his finger at us. Like, I can't believe you made that mistake. Later when we had a little more momentum and things were moving and if he wanted to come back to that and, and maybe help us find the, the lesson in it that he saw, 
he would do that later when we already had the wind at our back again, right? He, he, he didn't want to kind of double down on the fact we were already bummed that something did not work, right? It's just not the time, uh, in my opinion, to, uh, to kind of double bum us out, uh, you know, and we're hard on ourselves as it is. But if he thought like, you know, he could come back later if, uh, and say, hey, let's talk about that thing that happened. Um, would, would love to share something that I experienced during it. At a time when we, you know, had a little momentum, I think that was the right time to do it. So I think that's just a great leadership quality, understanding that certain lessons will be rejected in certain moments because the stress is already high enough and they'll be better received at other moments when maybe we're, we've, we've had a little time to process and are in a different headspace. Is that what you were looking for, Steve? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested though, beyond, beyond the workplace, how do, you, how do you use that philosophy in your personal relationships? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you how I do, I use it with myself. I've recently, um, we, uh, Leslie was acquired by Seismic, you know, uh, seven, seven months ago and all my direct reports, um, now report to other people. So I don't have any direct reports. So I'm trying to figure out what to do with myself. And I started doing some, some, uh, woodworking and some clay, uh, just working with clay and some wood. And what I did with the clay project is, uh, I just signed up for a class Intr introduction to, uh, I'm sorry, with the wood project, I signed up for a class cause I don't have any tools. So I wanted to figure out how to use the tools and I wanted to figure out how to get my hands going with some wood. And I picked a project that was literally just to create a little box. Uh, and this box had no, you know, there was no sp special detail to this box, but here's why I wanted momentum. And I knew if I built this box, then I could get uh, a little bit of momentum to try something a little harder. Other people in the class pick some really difficult projects for their first woodworking projects. And it became very difficult for them to get momentum. You know, they had some finesse in their projects that I did not have and finesse in woodworking, I think difficult, uh, unless you know, really know what you're doing. So they would have maybe their projects halfway there. And the thing that required a little bit of finesse, they would accidentally cut too much and they had to start over. And it's like, I don't think that is the best way to learn something is to start with a really, really challenging, you know, pro project and then be frustrated the whole way through. I think the best way to learn something is to not be embarrassed by doing something quite simple. Because for me, it, even though it was a box, it was still a lot of work. You know, cutting 45 degree angles was still a lot of work for me. So I, I applied the momentum challenge uh, to, to that personally. of like, let's just get a little momentum here. Let's finish with a box. I and mean, then I can make something, you know, a little more difficult after that. And, and that's exactly what my daughter would do. You know, she is a momentum instructor for me. Uh, when, when, when she learns to play, when she has learned something she does it by playing and she doesn't start by playing by being like what's the most intimidating thing i can tackle uh she just starts by doing the thing that she can do in that moment and getting better and better at it by repeatedly trying and she never looks left and right and says like how am i doing dad or am i doing this better than the other kid down the street or do other 18 month olds you know, do, this, do this better than me she is not comparing herself at all because it's completely irrelevant where anybody else is at on whatever it is that she's doing and i'd argue that's the same same way with a lot of the projects that you know adults pick up it's completely irrelevant how good anybody else at it, is at it it doesn't really matter what matters is like am i willing to play uh to learn how to do this thing or am i going to set, set such a high bar for myself that i'm just going to become discouraged really quickly my daughter you know just she plays her way to learning and i think that is the the fundamental way humans learn but over time we forget that play is learning and we start to think play is a wasting time um but it's not and that's, it's too bad that we mistake play for, uh, for wasting time because it's the most potent way to learn, period. Sounds like your next book, Leadership Lessons from Marnie. So. Yeah, I know. Well, she teaches me a hell of a lot. I mean, she, like I, I've said it before, she's picture perfect practicing because she's not comparing herself to somebody else. As soon as we begin to compare ourselves, we actually stop practicing, right? We're like, hey, how am I doing? Marnie's just still going with the thing that she you know, doesn't know how to do. And then, you know, three days later, she's literally like not been frustrated throughout the process. So she's quite good at it. Uh, and it's just wonderful to watch. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, maybe I'll ask the next question, but it's okay with you. I think, uh, you know, the very first chapter in the book is about uh, being vulnerable. And I, I think it kind of resonated with me because I think a lot of people, uh, I wouldn't say universally, but a lot of people, certainly majority, I would say that I know, think that being vulnerable is a good thing, but actually on a practical level, kind of struggle with it. Yeah. Um, like what are the most kind of common barriers you've seen to actually achieving this and, and, and actually being vulnerable in work and in life? And why do people find it so difficult, do you think? Yeah, 
I, I think f fundamentally, uh, like the difference you're seeing of people kind of verbally saying, I understand vulnerability, yeah. but then pra pra practically struggling to do it. Yeah, um, they say, I, I want to be more vulnerable at work and then kind of not doing anything about it because the norms that they've inherited like don't allow them to kind of break out and do that. It seems, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to answer this question in two different ways. First, I think it's, let's talk about the difference between intellectual understanding and practical understanding, because I think I don't think this gets talked about enough at all. I think it's poorly understood, and I think we're literally taught that intellectual understanding is understanding. So in, in most other languages outside of English, there are two words for knowing. There's intellectual knowing and there's practical knowing. So I can come to you in Spanish and tell you I, I practically know something. And that is a different way of saying that I intellectually have heard of something or have read about something. But in, in English, we're just like, I know it. And I might intellectually know many things and practically understand very few, right? Because practical, practical understanding requires behavior. I literally have to do the thing a bunch of times for it to become <laughs> second nature. It's almost like we can have things in our head, but until they're in our heart, they're not in our behavior. Until they're in our heart and soul, they're not in our behavior. So how do we get things from our head to our heart and soul? Well, we have to recognize that practice is the only way that, that, that we, ha we have to just try the thing that we intellectually understand. And by practicing it, we will become practically able to understand it. And we will have a whole different perspective on it because most things that I think I know intellectually, once I begin to do them, I realize I didn't really know them at all. You know, I only really know them in, when I do them. It's like, it's like somebody, uh, it's like me reading about pregnancy and my wife having been pregnant, right? She's got a lot more intelligence on that than, than I do. Uh, and, and I think a lot of times we mistake reading about pregnancy for having been pregnant, you know, in, in all these different parts of our lives and all these different understandings. So these I, are two I different think, uh, I think as, as in pre-sales, I think that's really, really true. Like, I think a lot of people who are, you know, sales engineers or solution engineers, like intellectually, you understand how the technology works, right? Mm -hmm. But do you really practically, have you ever implemented it you know how many customers sure. have you really worked with like do you really know it yeah yeah, yeah. And, and getting across that trust to somebody is uh is very important i think you know i don't just There's... i haven't just been through the training course like i actually know i know this truly yeah, yeah, yeah. right right and that's why we yeah. we launched practice modules right unless yeah. we, had, we had learning and then we launched practice and because because it's like you can... We, we, we can we can learn you know, learn all day long if we don't practice what we've learned it's not going to stick and pra and so i think this is one of the reasons people are very critical of themselves which is to my my second uh, uh answer to you they don't realize that intellectual understanding and practical understanding are two different systems in the body uh and and one of them is in charge and one of them is not and i think we mistake that intellectual understanding actually changes our abilities and then we get really frustrated when we intellectually learn something like, like maybe we just learned uh, the process for having a difficult conversation or maybe we just learned how important it is to be patient when somebody does x y or z thing and then it happens and we find ourselves not being patient and we go what is wrong with me i just learned yesterday how important it is to be patient and here i am not being patient well the system that learned patience is not the system that's in charge right the system that's in charge is our body right is our heart and soul not our brain uh, and so there's no, I'm not surprised that you learned something intellectually yesterday in your brain and you're, it's not all, where, all, all of a sudden in your body. But I, I think people judge themselves very harshly uh, for that. And that is a shame because it's, it, they're, they're, they're misjudging. Uh, what's happening is what should be happening. What's happening is the human experience and what they think should be happening is, has never happened before, right? Which is that all of a sudden when we intellectually understand something, it becomes part of our our, our operating system and our, and our body on, just gets it. That doesn't happen. If it happens, it happens very, very, very rarely. So just judging ourselves how things are supposed to work instead of how, how they've never worked, I think is very important. Um, and so let's re recognize that intellectual and practical understanding are two different things. And then let's ask ourselves, why is it difficult to actually practice vulnerability? And I think the root of this uh, is just self-acceptance. Because what vulnerability is, is if I'm nervous about something, in, uh, inside, you know, in my inner world, I sense that I'm nervous about something and somebody asked me my opinion on it and I'd say outside, I, I'm nervous. I, I externalize that and I say, I'm feeling nervous. Um, that's me being vulnerable. <clears throat> but if internally I'm feeling nervous and somebody asks me how I feel and I say, I think it's great or, you know, um, I have no opinions or, you know, no, awesome. This is a great idea. And I don't sh share that I'm, I'm nervous. That is not being vulnerable. So really, I just think vulnerability is um, projecting outwardly what is happening inwardly. If I'm excited inwardly, I say I'm excited. If I'm sad inwardly, I say I'm sad. 
And if I sit, sit inwardly and I tell you I'm fine um, outwardly, uh, I'm not being vulnerable. So why would we struggle to, to say what's happening inside? Well, because we don't accept what's happening inside. And we think others will find it unacceptable. Um, so we change what's happening inside. And so I think acceptance is at the root of the whole thing. I, I have to accept that if I'm nervous, I'm nervous. And I also have to accept that if I tell somebody I'm nervous and they don't accept that, that isn't my problem. I, I'm, I'm a, if I am, if I, I am, the I hardest am. Bit. You know, that yeah, for me, that is. might be the hardest bit of it because it's externalizing how you feel if, 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 and, and realizing that I don't care if they disagree, that's the hardest bit because I probably do still care if they disagree. Like, if yeah. you see what I mean? Yeah. 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 Practic practically, uh, how my therapist tells me, uh, you know, this shows up and I agree with him because this is my experience. Uh, practically, you will care uh, uh, in that moment, right? It's, it's, it's tough yeah. to have somebody judge you, it, especially if it comes up in any way condemning, right? Like, you should be better than that. Like that is just hard for humans, right? But we can develop a, a practice that I think is, is, is a healthy one of, of recognizing that whatever they just threw on us, whatever, you know, they just told us uh, that we're not, in some way we're not good enough is really just them projecting their own inner reality on us. That's all it is. They don't feel good enough. Therefore they can't, you know, there's something going on in them that they just spit back on us. Uh, and, and we don't need to carry it. So even if it hurts in the moment, you know, recognizing that this is, because somebody who is, is centered with themselves is not going to be uncomfortable with you being nervous. They're going to be like, you seem nervous. Anything I can do? Uh, but, it, but they're not going to tell you that you shouldn't be nervous if you are nervous. They're going to say, oh, that's where you are, right? Um, so I think we just react on one another and we take those reactions very seriously. And I think it's really difficult to, in the moment, be honest with where you are if you're, if you're nervous about somebody condemning where you are or not accepting where you are. But I want to be in situations around people and work with people who uh, give space to that. Uh, not infinite space. They have their own boundaries, right? They don't necessarily need to take my emotions home with them. But if I show up and tell, tell them that I'm excited or nervous or sad or happy or confused, they don't tell me I'm wrong. Because I am. You know, they, they, they say, let's talk about it. Um, and that, that's an acceptance that when I get from somebody else, that increases my flow of communication. So anytime we shut down and tell people that they shouldn't be something that they are, we are naturally going to decrease communication in the future, right? I don't want to come back to that person uh, if I don't feel I can be authentic in front of them. Uh, so I'm going to start hiding myself. And I'm not suggesting anybody does this perfectly, right? My, my wife can come to me, tell me she's nervous, and I might tell her, you don't, you know, you, don't, you shouldn't be, right? I'm not telling you I, do, I nail this. I'm telling you that it's very important for me to uh, evaluate uh, and, and say like, hey, is that how I want to show up next time? Uh, because that, you know, I, I told my wife, you know, she wasn't what she said she was. And who am I to say that? You know, I'm not suggesting anybody's going to nail this, right? I just think we need to be aware that if we tell people to be something different than, than their feelings uh, and how, how they're showing up, uh, we ask to be communicated with less in the future. And so if we can accept where somebody is and they can accept where they are, vulnerability becomes easier. But self-acceptance, I think, is the most difficult human thing. Acceptance of the world, like the world is what it is. Um, and while I don't agree with every part of it, I accept that it is, and I am who I am. And while there are parts of me that frustrate me, I accept that they're there, right? That, that's all acceptance is. Um, it's just being able to look at ourselves and the world um, and, and not act like parts of it don't exist or, or, uh, and, or parts of it should be better. So I won't go on about acceptance because it's, uh, I probably could all day. Um, but if, if, if somebody was gonna talk about like, how do I heal? And how do I show up differently in the world? I would say start with self-acceptance um, because it'll change everything about your world. Yeah. That's I'll, share my, yeah. I'll share my talk with my therapist. I interviewed him about, uh, about boundaries and self-acceptance. It's on YouTube. Um, he's a wonderful person. And uh, I recommend listening to it if you've ever wanted to learn more about assertiveness and being assertive uh, without, you know, dominate, without being like, you know, over dominating to somebody else. Because I think people hear assertiveness and they think that means I'm going to run people over. And he's very clear that it just really, it does not mean that at all. Um, and that it's a very healthy thing to show up assertively uh, and to have a sense of self. So I'll share that talk in the chat. And if anybody wants to listen to it, feel free. Lovely. Yeah, definitely. Please do. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks hey. for having me, by the way. Hey, this I is enjoy, fantastic. I, I, I enjoy this a lot, if you can't tell. <laughs> any, any other questions from, uh, from the group? Uh, 
Who are the ones go? Yeah, Franklin. Yeah, I got either. one. Or Mark, Mark oh. or Franklin. Let's go. Let's go in that go, order. Mark and like then Frank, Franklin. Yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> so Franklin <laughs> give me the uh, point. No, great conversation. I didn't realize uh, just from David's little nugget around vulnerability. That was that was deep, but that was really good. Of didn't even think about that. That intellectual and that practical. Mm. Um, but love love the book. Love that as a quick read. Having been in some smaller startups, that's like something I wish I had. It's kind of that playbook of, hey, here's how we do work here. Uh, yeah. Curious your thoughts as you guys, you know, got acquired or as you guys grew, how did you like make sure you're keeping that culture and uh, making sure that that folks knew that's kind of how they were? Because uh, personally, I like, came from a 150 person company, now within the Salesforce machine, massive corporation mm. of that kind of transition where, at the smaller company, like I knew everyone, I felt I could be that vulnerable. But then at this larger corporation, it's a little tougher. You're kind of like figuring out, you know, where you where you fit in in the big cog. Yeah, yeah. Um, as soon as we sold the business to Seismic, um, all the values that Lesson Lee had, uh, um, they still mattered, right? But as soon as we sold the business to Seismic, it became about the executive team at Seismic and what they value, because the system reflects. Uh, what the board and the executive team at Seismic value. And so the behaviors that we see, the um, the way things are arranged and aligned and set up, uh, what, 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 what's appropriate and what isn't, what's, you know, celebrated and what isn't, it no longer came from me and, and the lesson executive team and our board. <coughs> Sorry, it switched. So um, you asked, like, how do we think about keeping it? I think everybody needs to understand what they value and do their best to show up that way. Um, but if we're in a system that has a different set of perspectives, we have to understand that um, individual behavior uh, in that system isn't going to change the system unless the system itself, the people in charge of the system itself, want it to change. So if sale, if you, you came from one company and now you're at Salesforce, I'm going to take a quick drink because I've got something in my throat. What Salesforce values is ultimately going to determine your life. Uh, whereas before what uh, the you know executive team and, and the board at your last company valued was going to be the biggest determinant on your you know working time and, and your home time right because if they uh, rode you on deadlines and asked you to work you know ridiculous hours that's going to affect your entire life right not just the time that you're supposed to be on the clock so what I'm getting at is uh, it really matters the values of the company um, and we we don't we don't change systems from the the, the bottom uh, up uh, without a traumatic event happening and you know the goals at the top changing. Um, I, I I used to believe um, I think naively uh, that uh, individuals in systems um, if they don't have you know the the power to set the goals for the system can change them. Uh, but it really matters that the people who do do set the goals change the goals if we want a system to change. Ultimately, that's the greatest way to change a system is change change its goals, right? So we we wonder why like we keep electing different presidents and getting uh, very similar outcomes. Like uh, it's because the goals don't change when the president becomes the president, right? The goals of the American economy, the goals of the American system, aren't up to the president. Uh, they're already happening, and there's already inertia. And until you know we de we decide the president puts things in motion to change some goals, and other people go with those changes. It's just going to look very similar president to president. And I'm not suggesting every president looks the same, uh, but uh, I'm suggesting that the outcome of those presidents isn't dramatically different president to president a lot of times because the goals don't change president to president. And this is just a, a way of making a, an example, right? We think that changing the people is going to change it, but we have to change the goals of the system to change to change its values. So it might not be where you're going for, Mark, but you're in a certain set of values, right? And those values are going to dominate you before you dominate them. I think it's really important to understand am i in a system that aligns with my values because the system's going to win uh it, it's going to win it's going to change you before you change it uh so you know picking your system is important uh and i wish people had more of an awareness of that because people stay in systems that they hate and they complain about them for decades and they think that they're somehow going to get out of it unharmed uh when they're you know when they're retired like the system won't change them they'll just stay the same person through it and they'll just you know grit their teeth and get through it oh no the system will change them uh it'll change them in in, in major ways over time so they need to get out of that system if they don't want to be changed by it i but i'm not suggesting that's easy because if it were easy right. more people would do it right it's not easy i'm not saying that this is trivial it's very much not trivial right but i think that awareness that the system wins 
is a potent one. Uh, and I think it helps us evaluate what systems we're in and decide, does this align with me? Mark, any, 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 any clarifying thoughts or anything I didn't, I said that that didn't make sense. No, I didn't think it'd go that way, but that's a very good, different perspective of I think how we look at it. And I think I've been in the same spot as you. It's like, oh, bottom up, we can change it. It's like, sometimes at the end of the day, you just gotta be realistic too. Yeah, I, sometimes you can, right? If the if the executive team's open to it, right? If the, because the executive team might just have a blind spot and be like, oh crap, thanks for calling that blind spot out. We're gonna make this a priority, right? Uh, and, and that's gonna become a goal. And then things can really change. So I'm not suggesting that it's, it's impossible. I'm saying that certain people have to care. And if they don't right. care, it, it ain't happening. Fair enough, appreciate it. Frankly. Yeah, I hope that's not too, hope that's not too dreary. A massive, <laughs> massive bottoms up uprisings do work, right? They just require, a, it's just, just tremendously painful. Um, and, and they require overthrowing the people at the top uh, or getting them to change their mind, you know, by serious pressure, which I'm not really sure is changing their mind. I think it's just getting them to be coerced. You get the idea. I'll stop. <laughs> Franklin, go ahead. You have the next question, I think. Okay. Max, I'm impressed with your personality and your energy, but I think the thing that impresses me the most when I watch you is how much attention and listening you do when people ask their questions. So thank you. Mm. That's, that's yeah, th thanks, thanks, Franklin. I appreciate it. Th yeah. Thank you. My question is going to be a little bit more basic. I'm really interested in understanding some of the influences or books that you look at that have heavily weighed on you and kind of shaped your journey. Yeah. So this gentleman, Gabor Mate, um, I'm, I'm going to share a link there. Uh, he has a book called When the Body Says No, uh, which uh, I absolutely love. It can be a little, it's basically anecdote, a bunch of anecdotes about people who uh, are caregivers um, who do not realize that they are caring for others at the detriment of themselves. They are completely out of balance in that the care that they give to others is not the care that they give to themselves. So they have basically two sets of logic. One logic of this person requires certain uh, care and a different logic of I require different care. Um, and uh, they don't necessarily see that those two sets of logic are contradictory. Um, and uh, because they're not serving themselves and over serving other people, uh, they become sick with chronic stress. Be, through stress, through chronic stress, they become sick with chronic illness. Um, and so this, this YouTube video that I just shared a YouTube video of me talking to my therapist and the YouTube video of Gabor Mate walking around a room sharing um, how important it is uh, that we care for ourselves uh, and that caring for ourselves is not a selfish act. Uh, it is the only way we heal the world is that individuals uh, and heal the world. That might sound very extravagant to you or even silly. If we want to make the world healthier, each individual needs to be healthier. And all I can really do is control my own health. Uh, I've tried to change other people many, many times in my life and found it to be very unreliable, very difficult, and actually near impossible. I don't know if I've ever changed anybody in any way. Uh, I think when people change, it's because they decide they want to, right? So I spend a lot of time pushing people who are not at that moment saying, I want to be pushed, right? Um, and that just doesn't work because they just push back the opposite way. And now we're just wasting energy pushing against one another. Um, so I think the best way to change the world for, for me is to try to calm myself. Because if I am a calmer individual and I enter a room with nine people who are not so calm, um, so let's say there's 10 people in a room, I'm one of them, and we all are in a frenzy, and I figure out how to calm myself uh, more regularly than I used to, I have made that room calmer. Uh, and, and so then that, that just zoom out to the whole world. If I am one person in the whole world and I am able to calm myself, have I made the world calmer? Well, yes, I absolutely have, right? Uh, objectively. Uh, I'm doing the only thing I really can do in my life is just figuring out how to regulate myself. And by being a re more regulated individual, I spread less hurt because hurt people hurt people, right? And hurt people are dysregulated. Uh, and so if I am more regulated, I am less likely to inflict my pain and my trauma on somebody else. So I think my whole job is to show up uh, and try to heal myself. And healing, not healed, you know, healing is really what I'm working on. I'll never get to like 100% healed, yeah. right? It's a, it, it's a process. Uh, and I'm constantly, you know, going through new things. Like I just recently lost uh, one of my best friends, got killed in an avalanche, right? So if I was healing before, that's, that, that was a major setback that might slingshot me forward later, but you know, it ripped open a new trauma in me. So this is a life process, you know, like suffering is a part of it. 
But I really appreciate Gabor Mate because he helps me understand that that is my primary objective uh, and that should be all of our primary objectives. But instead we spend too much time trying to fix other people uh, as if we can. So more than probably you bargained for, but mm. I love Gabor, I lo I love Gabor Mate. Um, could not love him more. And then Chris Didnett wrote a book called Self-Compassion. Uh, and I, I had that book on my shelf for five years, maybe four years before uh, I finally read it. And when I started reading it, I was like, it's been here all along. Like I've been running around my house looking for these answers. And there it is, this book about self-compassion. And she basically it was the first person to scientifically uh, study self-compassion. A lot of people had studied self-esteem and she was like, uh, that's interesting, but I don't think self-esteem is actually where, where health is. Um, self-compassion, I think is where health is. So she started studying self-compassion. And, and if you wanna be self-compassionate, just think about uh, what is the advice that you give to a friend? What is the advice that you give to somebody you deeply love, but love in a healthy way? Um, not like you know, you're know you wrapped around them and codependent, like you, you love them and care for them, but you can be objective. The advice that you'd give to that person is the advice you give to yourself when you're self-compassionate, right? So when, when, that, when, when your best friend makes a mistake and they start to think it's the end of the world and you look at them, you go, oh, it's not the end of the world and, I, and, I, and you're still loved. Uh, that's the same thing that self-compassionate people say to themselves, right? We learn to befriend ourselves instead of be the worst boss in the world to ourselves. And for most of my life, I had the worst boss in the world in my head. I, I hired them, I trained them. I allowed that person to speak to me in ways that I would not allow anybody else to speak to me. Um, and I have now learned that that voice was just really hurt and I've learned how to talk to it and calm it down and have it interact with other voices in my head to be a healthier person. And self-compassion is the only way I think that's possible is practicing self-compassion uh, is the only way I think that gets done. At the root of self-compassion is acceptance to bring, bring this all the way back to acceptance. I cannot be self-compassionate if I am not able to accept where I am. So those are two people I'd recommend checking out. I think they're, they are healers in the world. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Pleasure. Any, any follow-ups? No, 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 absolutely not. I'll let it go to Steve now. All right, cool. Excellent. Well, first, Max, I'm going to say thank you for the book. I mean, the book was amazing. And thanks, PSC, for choosing this as one of the books that otherwise probably would not have fallen into my hands. And, and I think it needed to fall into my hands. Good. Um, I'm, I, my question, and I'm going to open up a little bit. My, my question is going to be about um, the nonviolent communication. And I want you to kind of expand on that a little bit. Um, it, it just from my perspective, because I think it's interesting, I fell into a, uh, an industry and work as a job where our job is basically to instruct and talk. Mm -hmm. And we help people with their problems, but we know what the problem is and the answer is, and we alert it to, to people. Yeah, yeah. And in that switch between that and home often is a tough switch mm. for us to toggle. And I also, my, I came from a family of educators, high school principals, teachers, et cetera, who also instruct. And so our normal communication was full combat communication, uh -huh. you know, where, you know, everyone, everyone had an opinion, everybody could put an opinion out. No one got hurt in those opinions because we were all striving for knowledge. We were mm -hmm. all driving to do that, but our style was very different. And mm -hmm. so what I've had a hard time and my wife is very um, intuitive and, and sensitive and very conversational, which mm -hmm. so that obviously you can see where that draws some interesting things, but being able to use you know, um, MVC has helped because I'm able to articulate. And I just wondered if you could expand on that a little more because, you know, it, it's, as you said, it's going to help my journey. I'm, I'm taking baby steps right now, but yeah, I think too. it's an important thing. And if, if you could maybe expand on that, that would, um, I would be really interested. Yeah, Steve, I think the only steps there are, are baby steps. I think we, we rarely get slingshotted forward, uh, uh, you know, um, so I hope you're uh, compassionate with yourself about that, that baby steps is maybe all we can do. Um, but if I'm hearing you right, Steve, are you saying that uh, you might come to a conversation with your wife and uh, for lack of a better term, be blunt and direct and uh, it might not hit her the way that it would, it would have hit maybe one of your family members that you grew up with who was more used to that style or, or did I mishear you? 
that that is part of it. The other thing is I often will internalize what I'm feeling because I know mm. it may hurt her as well. And therefore I carry that as opposed to being able to articulate my feelings in the nonviolent way of saying what I hear you say. And when you say this, it makes me feel this. And it might be helpful if we could do this versus me just internalizing it. And again, furthering the hate or furthering that pain as you talk mm -hmm. about that can mm -hmm. happen. So that was, it, you, you were right about it, but there was a little more to it. Yeah. 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 So, uh, when you say uh, with your wife that you worried about hurting her, has she expressed that you, that you being sharing your feelings will hurt her? I think sometimes sharing the truth with her hurts her. Yeah, yeah. And I, so it's how do I express what I'm feeling versus saying it's an absolute truth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I love about NBC. So I'm I'm really glad we had that final uh, bit on on. Uh, on you know your truth right because uh, what N nbc does uh in my opinion is really helps people speak in i terms uh i saw this uh, i felt this way about it because i value certain underlying you know quote unquote needs like consistency or respect so maybe somebody said something to me and i said um maybe they said to me hey, hey max your team is slow and i come to them later and i say uh my observation of that situation uh, you know is that you said my team was slow uh, I'm going to quote them, right? You said my team was slow. I was frustrated when I heard that, which is the feeling I had inside, because I value um, communication and respect. And uh, I wish we would have had that conversation one on one instead of, you know, in front of other people. You know, I'm just making up this example right now. But what, what I did there when I brought that, you know, fake example to somebody was I spoke in in my experience of it. I did not generalize that experience as though it is the gospel of the world, right? Everybody thought you were being mean. Everybody thought it was stupid. Everybody thought you should have talked to me about that one-on-one. -on -one. People hate that shit. Uh, you know, to generalize, people hate that shit. When somebody comes in and says the whole world thought what you did was stupid or everybody knows that's, you know, really lazy. When they start hearing you is when you just speak to your personal reality in a way that it's not condemning uh, right? It's not condemning. It's a very important part of this. And NB NBC basically makes it very difficult to be condemning if we're following uh, the, 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 the four steps. To say I'm frustrated is not to condemn them. It's just to say my inner reality was frustration, right? That, that's going to happen. It's just a part of the human experience, right? It's not condemning you that, you know, somehow I became frustrated when I saw something happen. Um, my underlying needs are part of the human experience, right? To value, respect, and communication is not novel or unique, right? Other other humans value those things too. Um, so what I what I like about it is it, it keeps it keeps me in line to stick to the things that are uh, unimpeachable, unimpeachably true, and not just my opinions of the situation. And so Marsha Rosenberg is very clear in the book Nonviolent Communication, which I which I do recommend checking out. Um, that our thoughts are different than our feelings, right? And I talk about this in, in, in Do Better Work as well, but we, we, we mostly walk around expressing our thoughts. I thought that was stupid. I thought that was dumb. Um, I thought that went on too long. I thought that meeting could have been ran better. And we walk around thinking our thoughts are somehow gonna be relatable to other people, um, but our thoughts can be pretty unique to us. If we walk out of a meeting and say, I'm frustrated um, about that meeting, somebody else might go, yeah, me too. Uh, and because we're stating our feelings about the situation, not our thoughts. So our, our, our feelings are universal. Everybody's been frustrated. Everybody's been you know, scared, but not everybody has the, all the thoughts we might have about those situations. So it helps us find the common language. If you're concerned, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna get to your wife now. Steve, if you're concerned um, about you know, hurting your wife um, in, in your communication, I think it's really important to let her know that, uh, that you wanna be gentle. Um, but you also need to be able to express how you're feeling um, and know and know that and let her know that your feelings and your emotional reaction to things, um, she didn't uh, she didn't cause them. OK, if you if you get frustrated about something your wife does, um, the frustration is in you, not in her, uh, period. She didn't put the frustration in you. The flame was there and something she did fanned the flame. But the flame is in you. Uh, the flame is in me, right? When I'm frustrated, the flame is in me. So if I think about these emotions as kind of in us and people, other people's behavior can stimulate them um, or calm them down, we recognize how much uh, that they emanate from us, not from somebody else. But I think one of the things that we're really, really, is really difficult to see in the world is our feelings are our own. Um, so if I'm frustrated, that frustration's in me. And the only person who can really tame that frustration, calm it down, is me. 
And just because somebody's behavior stimulated that frustration doesn't mean it's not in, in me. Nobody else put it there, right? Um, so letting your wife know that it's not her responsibility to um, carry your feelings or to feel responsible for your feelings, I think is very important because if she feels responsible for them, you might hide them, right? Y you might not share them. Um, and then, then you're gonna push them down and then they're gonna get the best of you somewhere else in your life because the feelings cannot be ignored. When we ignore our feelings, they become like abused dogs. Um, they become like wild dogs yeah, is what happens when people ignore their feelings. They become uh, very, uh, we don't know what they're gonna do. But when we, when we honor our feelings and care for them and, uh, and respect them, they become like, like pets. Does, and pets, I can't tell my pet exactly what to do, uh, right? But I can communicate it with it better. It still has a mind of its own, but I can communicate it with it better. And I think one of the big discrepancies for people who really do not like talking about emotions is most of their emotions are wild animals. They're wild dogs because they have not respected those emotions um, because they don't know how to. Uh, but if we can respect our emotions and treat them more, we can get them to be more like pets where they're more predictable. They're more easy to communicate with, right? And, and they don't fly off the handle. I don't, though, think I answered your question to any sufficiency, Steve. So I'd like to come back and ask you what I missed. No, I'm just reading some. Yeah, go I think ahead. you Correct. really did. No, no, perfect. I, I think you really did because, you know, it was um, it. I was using a specific example with my wife. I think many of us, I saw other heads nodding when we talked about not moving from instructor mode and we come home and we often are doing the same thing, whether it's our kids, our wives, our friends, yeah. our whatever, um, party events, next thing you know, we're on our soapbox. And, you know, it's, mm -hmm. just, yeah. it's just so hardwired of what we do that it's hard for some of us, so, you know, speak for myself, it's, it's hard for yeah. me to sometimes find that neutral you know, position. And I think you you really were helping to articulate that because I think you're right. I think there's a lot of times where uh, there are things that we see and it is more about the emotion than it is the actual thing. And it's not so much that it's about how do I articulate that emotion in a way that is not, as you said, condemning somebody else. And that's, that's what the, and I'll call it your teaser chapter on nonviolent communication, which did make me go mm -hmm. and purchase the book. And, and so I'm, Good, yeah, yeah I, 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 it was one, you know, that, that really resonated with me in the sense of saying, if I can understand, because it really comes to a communication, well, obviously it's in the name, but for me, yeah, yeah. it's one of the things in communicating with my team and communicating with others of saying there have to be, I feel that I'm a great communicator because I do it for a living and people understand and hear what I say. Mm -hmm. I suck as a personal communicator because I'm not sharing mm -hmm. emotions, I'm sharing facts. And, mm -hmm. and this is something that's helping me understand how to communicate feelings. And I think this is only going to help me in my career as well, because all things being said, people buy from people they like, the more they know about you, the more they know you care and feel. And so being able to articulate some of that appropriately will be helpful there as well. So anyway, loved loved the book in total, loved that chapter, enough to really dig into it. And, and thank you for your personal insights on that. Steve, thank you. Nonviolent communication has changed my life again and again and again, from my sense of self to my vocabulary for feeling words and needs words. Um, and I just think it's a really, really beautiful gift to the world. Uh, it just takes time, you know, it takes time to, un to kind of think left in a condemning uh, brain and more in a compassionate brain to myself and to others. I, I honestly think if I was going to simplify my life's journey, it's to go from a condemning vantage point to a compassionate vantage point. It's to condemn less and be compassionate more. Um, and uh, my wiring is condemning, right? I look out and I judge harshly. Um, and what I'm trying to do is practice uh, ways to change my wiring to be more compassionate to see the world differently so that it's easier for me to bring compassion to myself and to others. And honestly, like that's just my arc, going from here to here, condemning uh, and just driving more compassion and not, not gonna get there in every way, shape and form, right? I'm still gonna have this animal in me that just wants to condemn stuff, right? But I'm just trying to spend more time with that compassionate part of me that just is very tired of that and sees that it's not life-giving um, to me or to anybody else. Uh, so the nonviolent communication has really helped me in that in that regard. Do we have time for one more or did I run us out? We have a couple of minutes left for sure. Uh, yeah, it's been fantastic by the way. It was an amazing conversation. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll finish with one. We can just do a very quick one at the end, which is at the very end of the book, you put in this great chapter about bringing brightness to the room and how it's very important mm -hmm. to bring brightness to the room. 
how do you, I mean, I think you've kind of answered this already with the way that you've conducted this session, actually, <laughs> but how, how do you uh, change this concept of uh, bringing brightness to the room in a virtual world? You know, the, these book clubs are yeah. all happening yeah. virtually. We're all meeting virtually all the time. Anything that you can share with the group about, like the way you might change things to bring brightness to the room in a virtual setting? Yeah, David, I would love to hear what you, when you were alluding to something about this meeting, what are you alluding to? Because, you know, you're so engaging <laughs> to, to, to listen to, and you obviously like really are very passionate about the subject matter. And, and so when you speak, uh, it comes across, even though the meeting is virtual and it's not in person, mm. you know? Mm. So that's what I meant when I said, you know, I think you're bringing brightness to the room, you know, already, yeah. but yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, yeah. Just wins some, at, some wins at my back on this one. Yeah, wins at my back on this one. You know, you, you yeah. all you, you all made time to read the book. Uh, you respected. Uh, you know, that shows a respect to me that I appreciate, and um, I am uh, showing up here in this way because I'm grateful. Uh, and uh, you know that that spirit of gratitude, I think, is a great way to bring brightness to the room. Um, I mentioned earlier that my, my friend passed away very very suddenly. Uh, it is that is another thing that you know has really helped me show up. Uh, two spaces in a way that uh, is like, hey, I might not ever get to do this again. You know, like a, a way more practical realization of like, he just did not know he was going to be dead. You know, like I know for a fact he did not know he was going to be dead. We were talking right before he died and now he's gone. You know, so just the gratitude of being like, I get to do this uh, is, is, is special. Um, and, you know, channeling that. But I also have the benefit of having space to get good sleep, having space to move and having space to eat well. And I think if people are struggling to bring brightness to their lives, um, they might be in systems that are subjugating them and, and putting too much stress on them than any one person should have. Um, but the, and they're probably, if they're in a system like that, struggling to get good sleep, uh, to, to, to move well and to eat well. Um, and so if somebody is, is not feeling that they can bring brightness uh, with consistency, brightness just being, you know, calmness and excitability and also, you know, ideally um, vulnerability and, you know, I, just, I think a loving spirit um, if that is too difficult to do, I think it's because it requires a certain type of fuel and not everybody has access to that fuel equally. Um, and that fuel starts with great sleep. Uh, and, and cause we can't, I, can't, I do, I will not eat well and I will not, uh, move well if I do not sleep well. Uh, I'm just not going to want to get up and go. I'm going to pick different foods that are sugary, uh, uh, versus foods that might, uh, actually sustain me. It starts with my sleep, you know? So, if bringing brightness to the Zoom has been difficult for you all, you know, like let's analyze our sleep, let's analyze our moving, let's analyze our eating, and let's be compassionate to understand that moving the needle on those things is going to take a long time because the needle got where it is over 30 years, over 40 years, right? So moving it is a, isn't going to be a two week thing. You know, it might be a decade long thing. Uh, and you know, having compassion on that process. Thanks for the time, y'all. I, I, I don't want to hold you too much longer. Uh, um, so look. thank you for this. Max, uh, I just think I want to say thank you from, you know, from myself, from the group and uh, from, you know, on behalf of the pre -Sales Collective group. Uh, this has been fantastic. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, I, I thank everybody as well for your participation, for your questions and being uh, being involved. It's uh, it's great. And um, it's always great when we do these sessions, but it's always, you know, just that icing on the cake when you can actually get the author on board because <laughs> it well, really that, brings that new it. dimension to things, you know, it's really great. Amen. Hey, I, I had a blast. Thank you all. If yeah. I can be helpful in any way going forward, just say so. Uh, I, I, I like doing stuff like this. So take care. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, Max. And thank Peace. you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.